Ladies and gentlemen, would you please make some noise for Luke Peggy? Right. So, so this is what I've been up to. If you, if you absolutely must know, I've, I've um. I've been going to cafes a little bit, and I don't even like coffee. It gives me the squirts. Well, I go anyway because everyone else is doing it. I'm nothing if not a follower. And there's this, there's this one that's opened up near my place, right? This French family moved into my suburb. No one asked me. And they've opened up this bakery cafe because the dad, Frank Hoyce, is a baker. And They've done it so just to say that people like me can go down there and line up for our bread like it's wartime. <laughs> and when I see a queue for something, because I'm Australian, I'm joining it. <laughs> the first time I got to the front of the queue at this place, right, there was no thick cut square slice wide anywhere. <laughs> Pretty much rubber stamping the death of our rich 200 year old culture right there <laughs> with one $10 baggot. But I don't mind paying top dollar for good quality stuff. And they had gone to the effort of sticking some muesli and shit to the top of every loaf. So of course I'm going to buy one of them, take it home and slice it up at my place. Why would they do that? And just get out the dustpan and brush and see what happens there. <laughs> and I don't want to be facetious. I can't make this quality of goods at my house out of three simple ingredients. We ran out of ancient grains at my place probably 3,000 years ago. This, this is how far we've come, though, though. Right? I, can, I can go to a bakery and I can eat in at a bakery. I can take my family down there for a special treat. We can, we can sit around a milk crate, four of us around that, and just <laughs> eat a meal there. Like, so, you know, snaking on a dickheads around us waiting for their bread. Just so close to the action that my meal's getting sprinkled with dandruff and nose hairs and shit. <laughs> that's it. That's it. I, I can, this is how far, this is how progressive we are, too. I can, I can go in there and order a sandwich. And my sandwich will turn up at the table and they'll put the napkin now in between my sandwich and the plate. Just couldn't make that up. I can order a shake right and that'll roll out full of chia seeds and ginkgo balboa and all this other celebrity endorsed bullshit to clog up my straw. And they'll turn up at the table in a specimen jar. Oh, what a fucking time to be alive. Man. <laughs> but even I, a lover of the modern artisan cafe, even I have a line that I don't want crossed here, and that's when they try to trick me into buying porridge. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I don't mind porridge, it's fine. You know, I've got a couple of sachets of stuff in my doomsday grab bag. <laughs> I'm not above porridge, make no mistake. But I'm not leaving the house for it. And I'm certainly not paying 16.5 for a bowl. <laughs> Just because somebody dropped a blueberry in the centre and called it Bondi Oats. <laughs> no way. So, so, this is the other thing we've been up to as a family. We've been staying in other people's houses for our holidays. I used to have to go and book motels like a fucking idiot for our holidays. Now I can stay in somebody else's house and check out their stuff. <laughs> or they're not there. It's pretty cool. And this is... Landlords is something that, when I was a child, we used to look up to landlords and think they were important people. Now, any old bourgeois Bevan is getting a property and just leveraging off that and getting another one and repeating the process. I know a fucking Coldplay listener who owns three houses. <laughs> You're not special. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for multiple property ownership. How else are we going to continue to gouge the lower classes? What are we, commies? <laughs> No matter how greedy you are, though, you can't live in more than one house at a time. So I'm going to release some of them on the short-term property market. And these are the ones that people like me stay in. And from what I've seen, too, landlords now, they're quite into spirituality. They've got all these affirmative statements peppered around their houses. <laughs> we stayed in one. It was a solid 500 kilometres from the ocean. Still had a bowl of seashells on the kitchen table, though, didn't it? <laughs> to placate a rat racing city slicker like me. First thing I did when we arrived, I sat down on a, on a couch next to an embroidered cushion telling me to dance by myself. <laughs> first, first night we were there, I, um, I did my neck on a clapped out futon. I thought, oh shit, that's no good when I woke up. I thought, oh, it's fine. Someone's nailed a piece of driftwood to the wall over there and put in texture on that, fall down seven times, get up eight. <laughs> Well, I probably won't need a doctor, I've read that now. <laughs> and that's some mosaics on the wall. That's where you get some of your better stuff. A homemade mosaic with some statements. And this one said, oh, time is just an illusion. 
You know, well, you're damn right it is. The clock don't even have numbers. It's just a <laughs> couple of synchronised dolphins with some sticks swinging around it. I couldn't tell you what time it is. We ended up at this place checking out about two hours late at the end of our holiday. Turned out time was a little more fucking tangible in that instance. <laughs> They, they also had some canvases on the walls, like those ones that are split up. You know, no frames, why should they? And just <laughs> all, all different fonts on there, saying things like, oh, you know, if the only thing that will make you richer, everyone, is travel. And by travel, I mean negative gearing. <laughs> so by this early stage of our family getaway, I've got to say, my chalk was at all turned red. I was, it was only when I saw that there were three plates in the whole house, meaning we had to have a fight over who's going to eat their bangers and mash out of a fucking coffee mug. <laughs> I thought, man, I... Thank goodness all the knives in this joint are blunt, because I'm about to have one here. <laughs> but nothing relaxes me more when I'm paying off somebody else's third mortgage <laughs> than to just sink back into a beanbag that's never been washed <laughs> and read a really thick tablet of rules shit that I have to do at someone else's house. And this one is quite the mixed bag of regimented hospitality. I opened it up and it said, oh, welcome to Forest Dreaming Retreat, everyone. Me casa, Sue Casa. Yeah. Don't touch the air conditioning centers, you little grubs. Yeah. Yeah, help yourselves to the Balinese rice terrace and water feature we've prepared out in the backyard for you. Yeah. No kids on the hammocks, you grotty little fucking renters. Yeah. So landlords now, from what I've seen, they're all into power saving and water saving techniques. They love this. In their rules, it's all this water power saving stuff. And landlords, from what I've seen, the world over, they're united in their quest to save this beautiful planet. And don't get me wrong, I, I love the environment as much as the next bloke with the microphone. <laughs> but I'll be fucked if I'm going to somebody else's house and not just cranking up the aircon to maximum. <laughs> 24 hours per day. So when I get home from hunting at midnight, <laughs> I can use all the extra blankets. <laughs> Even in summer, I am quite partial to a snuggle. <laughs> one, one particular enjoyment amendment, though, that really jumped off the page for me in this book of rules was one that said, hey, guys, don't use the kitchen appliances unless you absolutely have to. They draw heaps of power, no good for the environment. Uh, you've got to start thinking about what sort of world you want to leave behind for your grandchildren. Me, heaps of properties. You losers are going to have to start thinking about which brand of bear your grandchildren can poke fun at at the zoo. So uh, don't use the kitchen appliances, such as the blender, the espresso machine and the sandwich toaster. Because they draw too much power. Which to me is just a classic, oh hey everyone, I'm up to my tattoos in debt here. <laughs> I've, I've just borrowed against Nan's pension to keep this thing going. I am literally one jaffle and two milkshakes away from this whole empire collapsing. <laughs> Help a battler out, keep his portfolio together, will ya? Yeah. While you're at it, don't forget to live, laugh and love. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so we don't stay in anyone else's houses anymore, right? Not because I don't want to. It's just we went and got a dog. And that pretty much precludes you from going fucking anywhere. They are, <laughs> they're worse than children in this respect. This, is, this changed quite a lot, having a dog. There was a time, right? We had a dog briefly when I was a child. And there was a time back when we used to treat dogs like dogs that <laughs> if your dog farted during the Sunday movie, you kick it outside. <laughs> As a guide, from anywhere in the house, four kicks and your dog would be outside. <laughs> Now, for a farting dog, there's charcoal pills and psychotherapy. <laughs> Dogs have got allergies now. What's happened? Some, some grifter tried to sell me a $120 jacket for my fur-covered dog. I said, man, I'm, I'm all right. This is, even in the depths of winter, this is nothing that two tear towels and rubber band won't fix. <laughs> and, uh, we started ours quite early on that regime. And now she's got that classic hourglass figure that breeders look for these days. <laughs> but it certainly changed. There was a time right when if you, if you saw your dog just sitting there licking his own sleuth, you go, fuck that. I, sh I shouldn't have to look at that. I could turn away. Well, why should I have to? So you just slam a bucket over his head out of jealousy and leave it there <laughs> for a month. 
<laughs> the guilt doesn't come cheap either, does it? You go to a vet now and they'll say, mate, your dog needs chemotherapy and a hip replacement. You're not going to believe this. It's going to cost you seven large. But uh, you're going to have to discuss amongst yourselves how much you love this valued member of your family and come up with a decision. You go, what? You're going to hit me some family value shit, are you? Like a dodgy independent politician. Man, maybe if you love dogs so much, you should adjust your bottom line. <laughs> Seven thousand dollars. I wouldn't spend that on me. I'd just die. <laughs> so, probably best part about having one is going out to in in public. You go to a dog park now, and cat people get a bad rap. Dog people lost their minds. You go down one, and they'll go, "Oh, dogs. They're so great, aren't they? They're so they're fantastic dogs, aren't they?" They go, "Yeah, they're all right." And they say, "Yeah, you oh, you forget sometimes they're not human, don't you?" I say, well, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> Then every now and then I'll look down and go, no, that's definitely a dog. <laughs> I take mine out for walks, right? And, and people come up to me and start talking to my dog. They don't talk to me. I haven't got my name, my phone number, and my stupid neck. So they just, they just nudge the ice by talking through my dog. Would, people come up to me, strangers and neighbours. So let's face it, strangers. <laughs> we'll just... Come right up to me and get on their hands and knees right there. It's really undignified. Just start talking to my dog. And they're like, oh, what's your name? What's your name? What's your, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And they keep saying it until I have to lean over and go, look, we're going to get to the shops. Will you, will you stop being so rude and answer this lonely fuckhead? So, all right. So anyway, welcome to my show. Thanks very much for coming down. I appreciate it. So, well, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's pretty much just like this, but for an hour. So, <laughs> so, um, so you, can't just, you can't just bash nerds anymore, can you? And, that's, and it's fine, don't get me wrong, I'm not a thug, I don't want to. But they've gone from being bashed to being revered in a very short time space. And I just think nerds would do well to remember what the inside of an s band tastes like. <laughs> and, adjust their adult behaviour accordingly. And I don't want to come out too hard on nerds either. I don't mind nerds, they're fine. There might be one here. I don't know, some of them look like us now. There's... <laughs> well, I think it's an equation as old as time itself though. If you take a nerd and you empower them, you're going to end up with a pervert. <laughs> but now, Thanks to the information superhighway, nerds can just meet other people online and then procreate as a result of that. Nerds, they used to have to build, solve or invent something and use the requisite cash to purchase the love of a woman. <laughs> now they just use trickery like the rest of you and meet people online, leaving their spare time free to reenact fictitious battles between witches and dragons and shit <laughs> and whatever else it is that's now acceptable for modern men to be doing. Well, one thing they have done quite well right, nerds, is, is that they've started making podcasts. And, but, you know, people said to me, you should listen to podcasts. And podcasts, to me, are just really unhygienic former Encouragement Award recipients in pairs <laughs> delivering an unsolicited frame-by-frame -frame analysis of a fucking movie made specifically for children. <laughs> Every week, forever. <laughs> and that's necessary. But people said to me, you could learn a lot from podcasts, mate. You should listen to them. I started listening to them right, because I, you know, I listen. And I started listening to the crime ones, and who doesn't love crime? What a boon that's been for all of us. Can you imagine a world without murders to solve? What an absolute bore. I, for one, wouldn't want to live there. But they said you can learn some stuff, mate. Listen to podcasts. So I started listening to the crime ones, and I learned one thing. And that is that the police, even more incompetent than I first thought. <laughs> Unbelievable. And don't get me wrong, I quite like the fuzz, right? One time, a tree fell down across our street. They turned up, directed traffic around it, did a pretty good job. You know? Sometimes they got on horses and just plough through a, a throng of people to remind us to continue to behave ourselves. <laughs> Who here hasn't walked out the front of a footy stadium and felt the squatch of a Clydesdale turd <laughs> right up the side of their sandal? But oh, I feel safe now. <laughs> Knowing that if things turn south, I might earn myself a taxpayer funded kick in the face from a half ton animal. <laughs> 
So one, one thing they have done very well too, I don't want to rip into the pigs, I quite like them. <laughs> this is... They've, they've pretty much gotten rid of drink driving in about a generation and a half. It's been a lot of hard work and they've done a very good job of this. But there are still a few men out there living the dream. <laughs> I know some and every... Every drink driving story I've ever heard, it always starts with, look, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and, and it ends with, man, if only I'd done this one little thing differently, the bastards wouldn't have caught me. I should have just stuck to the back streets like I usually do. I pulled out on the main road, the bacon was set up right there, the pricks. What, <laughs> what are they doing anyway? Why aren't they out there catching the real crooks? <laughs> Instead of hassling a good bloke like me, just going about his business, committing a crime. <laughs> And all of these places, they've got a theory on how to sober up in a hurry. Everyone's got one of these. They're all bullshit. None of them work, I've got to tell you. It's all like, oh, you know what you should do, mate? You should have a five-minute nap, a ten-minute shower, bloody run around the car four times. Bloody drink, drink seven litres of water, get a punch in the face from your best mate in between each litre. Yeah. Do 12 push-ups. But it's bullshit. None of them work. In my experience, the only thing that will sober you up in a very big hurry is to just run over someone on your way home from the pub. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. If, you, if you're not awake after that, you may never be. So, um, the other thing I quite like about the cops, right, is their complete lack of shame and embarrassment in asking for help to solve a crime. <laughs> from the very same public who pay their fucking wages. <laughs> and on a personal level, I don't mind this. I can't tell you how many times a squad car full of the filth had turned up at my work. <laughs> I said, what is that, mate? Is that four pallets of bricks that you've got to carry up ten flights of stairs? No problem. Get out, fellas. Let's muck in and help this guy out. <laughs> at the end of the day, I say, thanks, lads. That was really nice of you. In return, I'll just keep my ear to the ground around the neighbourhood and give you a tingle if something pops up. <laughs> this, this is what happened to me in terms of the cops, right? I was embroiled in a street brawl, and it was a big one. It was one of those ones where later on, onlookers get referred to as witnesses. It was huge. <laughs> The street got shut off, made the news, everything. It was a massive fight. There was heaps of fights breaking out, spot fights all over. The, the particular localised melee I was involved in ended up, there's like two on twos, few one on one fights. The one I was in, it ended up being one versus six. And I like to say I gave a good account of myself, but then there were six of us, so. <laughs> a little tip from the top, if you're involved in a street fight and there's a man walking towards you and he does that spit through his teeth, that. <laughs> He's, he's a fucking good fighter. <laughs> you, just, you don't learn to do that until you cracked a few skulls. <laughs> it was also one of those fights where improvised weapons were being used, which is a disturbing trend that's only begun since the Nanning State took all our guns. <laughs> I, I saw a guy sliding a tin of spaghetti into a sock. <laughs> that's what we've been reduced to in terms of street weaponry. It's embarrassing on a world scale. <laughs> but anyway, the fight kicked off. It was a massive fight. And the boys in blue turned up. You know, four of them at first, heaps later on. But the first four who rolled up, they were walking abreast along the footpath towards the fight. And two of them were chewing gum, and one of them had a neck tat. <laughs> they, they looked like a modern-day slips cordon that I'm supposed to respect. <laughs> and, and the fourth one, he was fat. And, you know, I don't care. If, you know, follow your dreams. I, it's nothing to... <laughs> It's fine. I, I'm not a. I'm all for equal employment opportunities. I'm not a fascist. In fact, I'm a campaigner. I'm, I'm not going to rest until everyone with a lisp has a job on the radio. <laughs> and, and and all firemen are wheelchair bound. <laughs> or fire women. Don't panic. <laughs> no. Women can be disabled now too if they want. But this was like a fat, like not a, not a bit overweight, he's a proper fat cop, but that's, you know, whatever. But it's, this is something I'll be teaching my kids, right? When, when you're running away from the cops, right, you know, normal one, skinny one, just <laughs> straight line, fast as you can. Get ready to do a little sidestep, some of them can be shifty when they go in for the tackle. When there's a fat cop around, though, they're not even going to give chase. They're going straight to plan B, sitting on the hip there, just pointing in the general direction of noise and kablam. See what happens, sort that out with some paperwork later on. <laughs> so when there's a fat cop around, kids, just be prepared to do some zigzag running. 
You're going to look like a silly Billy. <laughs> but it's better to be a silly Billy and alive <laughs> than one of those corpses about whom people say there lies a man who never compromised his dignity around <laughs> obese law enforcement. <laughs> so this... This fight rider, it was, just, it was just winding down. It was just coming to the end of it. And I was getting shoveled in the back of a paddy wagon by some of these goons. And one of them, right, he had his, he had his elbow on the back of my neck. He was about half my age. He was putting me in the van. He said, mate, we're going to take you down the station. We're going to charge you with common assault. You should take a long, hard look at yourself. So should I, young fella? Maybe you should take a long, hard look at yourself. Because I've just bitten a man's nose off. <laughs> and, and then I punched him out of his shoes. <laughs> And you've got the audacity to call that common. <laughs> so, so they're all right at this sort of stuff, right? Your entry level police scene. But when it comes, from listening to podcasts, when it comes to solving a murder, the pigs are fucking useless. <laughs> they cannot do the job. There must be a lot of retired policemen up there in Queensland, the retirement location of choice for all inept policemen. <laughs> just sitting there on the Sunshine Coast, just dragging the drinks trolley over to their cane lounger. <laughs> thinking, oh shit, I hope I die before all the unturned stones of my shit career <laughs> get catalogued for the whole world to see in a podcast. <laughs> and all that sunshine and beer, that does nothing for a man's memory. The rapid onset of dementia is staggering when a tenacious podcaster knocks on the door. <laughs> the number one leading cause of dementia in old men is, of course, being accused of some pervert shit from 40 years ago. <laughs> They can't remember a fucking thing once that got us. <laughs> and, this, and while I'm down here too, I don't want to rip into dementia. I'm not sinking the slipper in there, that's fine. Like it's one of those things, dementia, that we'll all have to deal with at one stage of our lives. Someone we know will have it or we will whatever. But what no one's saying about dementia is how much of a handy evolutionary tool it is just to prevent old men from going out and settling all their long-standing vendettas. <laughs> Can you imagine a world where all the men remembered every single shit thing that had been done to them throughout the course of their lives? It'd be absolute carnage <laughs> when they reach a point where nothing else matters. It'd be so much, hey, Dal, I'll just put a bag of lime and a shovel in the boot. Uh, just off to, to knock off all three of our sons-in-law. I hate their guts. <laughs> None of them are good enough for our girls. And, and while I'm at it, I'm going to rub out that bloke who put 13 items through on the 12 and under aisle 25 years ago. I still remember that. Paid with a cheque. Really pissed me off. <laughs> Where are the car keys? <laughs> what was I talking about? <laughs> I'd better just go and watch some telly. <laughs> Dementia saves a lot of lives. Take it easy on them. <laughs> So, so when I'm listening to podcasts, right, okay, it gets to a point where the crime ones, they'll say, oh, the family, they were desperate after a year, they didn't know what else to do, so they turned to a psychic for help. And I listen to that and think, if, what? What were you thinking, man? You've waited a year for that. What a kick in the teeth that is to the science of clairvoyance. <laughs> Everybody knows the moment somebody goes missing, you look at the horoscopes from that day. <laughs> work backwards from there. <laughs> it's almost as if these husbands and stepsons don't want the crime solved in the first place. <laughs> but that's, that's how crimes are getting solved now. It's pretty much by podcasters more than the police. This, oh, someone I know got murdered right, not by me. And <laughs> I didn't even call the police. I just found my nearest dork and just yanked him out from underneath his Darth Vader doona, which are... <laughs> Incidentally, now available in King Single for your larger single man. <laughs> and I just bought him a new computer and a microphone, told him to stop hitting himself and start a podcast and fucking sort it out. <laughs> and they say that, look, the filth, they're just sitting down at the station listening to podcasts hoping a clue pops up. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to respect them. There, there was a time, right? I don't, know, I don't know if anyone here is of my ilk, but when I was a boy, someone would ask you what you wanted to do. As a, when you grew up, an adult would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And you, inevitably, you'd just say cop. It was such a cool thing to say. You'd go, oh, I want to be a cop. And after cop, maybe you'd choose fireman. Then after that, you'd just choose something that never existed, like a dinosaur or an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> now, you ask a child what they want to do, you're like, mate, you can do anything. The world's your oyster. Your bloody gla glass is full to the brim. You're so special. You're amazing. You're, you're talented in every possible way. You can do whatever you want. 
Just pick something, go for it, follow your dreams. And what's your tune change when your kid says, oh yeah? Or in that case, I want to be a social media influencer or a, <laughs> a baby moon planner or a, a food blogger, philosopher, photographer. Uh, <laughs> do ya? Yeah. You know, before when I said sky's the limit, uh, what I meant was go mow the lawn, you fucking little turd burger. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Grow up. If, if your job didn't exist 50 years ago, you're as sus as a suitcase on a riverbank. <laughs> so, so, you know what else I used to look up to, right? I, I used to look up to other people's dads. Because my dad was a great bloke. I thought everyone's dad must be a great bloke. It's just going to work out. Didn't work out at all. I, I became a dad and I figured out it doesn't take that much to become one. Now, it's almost as if they let any old fuckwit become a dad now. <laughs> It's amazing. There's one, there's a dad who's got kids at my kid's school right and he's a cool dad. I can't stand cool dads. I am just having a second pop at you, cruising around trying to elicit high fives from kids, that sort of shit. It's contemptible. This guy right, he's one of these guys, he's, he's in his 40s and he's got fashion hair and not that reverse sideburn look you sometimes see on the modern youth. No, he's got like spiked, gelled up, spiked up hair. All the way around, spiked up hair and he's tall but not tall enough for me not to know what's going on up there. <laughs> just, just looks like a fenced off slice of Devon. <laughs> and all the, all the other, all the other parents there at school pick up time, they're, they're largely mothers, so they're not tall enough to see what's going on, but I know. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, leave him alone. He's a bloody great bloke. He's just a square peg. He's a special ray of sunshine in an otherwise flavourless world. He's amazing. It's like, bullshit. I can't stand this prick. He's a loser. He's, he's trying to negate something shit going on in his life. You'll see. But it, and most, most parents, right, who are resigned to the natural ageing process, when you turn up at school time to pick up your kids, you just turn up and through gritted teeth go, get in the fucking car, you little thing. <laughs> Cool dad, cause he's cool dad. He comes flying through the front gates on a skateboard. <laughs> doing, doing that shaky telephone symbol <laughs> on his way in. And this thing, right, that's, that's fine if you're an actual skater on your commute between acts of vandalism and petty crime. <laughs> or, or maybe it's all right if you're fresh off a mid-flight brawl and you've been zip-tied to seat 38G and... <laughs> You're posing for a photo with one of your mates doing the double, the, the Gold Coast, Gold Coast Den Passar salute. Or it's, as it's better known in the media, the Jetstar Jiggle. And while I'm down here too, I'm not going to be one of those comedians who rips into barley. Heaps through that, it's too much. Well, barley's fine. Like, statistically, about a third of you make multiple trips to Bali. And I'm not here to judge you filthy fucking pigs. <laughs> That's not my bag of chips. But when, when you're going to Bali, just remember who you're talking to when you announce your trip to Bali. I work with this bloke, and he's, he says that he goes, he goes to Bali by himself a fair bit, which should raise eyebrows on its own merits. But <laughs> when he sees he's going, he says, oh, no, I'm going to Bali, but I'm going to the nice part. I go to the beautiful part. I don't go to that shit part where there's Aussies bashing each other on the beach and there's chip packets and band-aids floating around the ocean. Yuck. No, that's disgusting. Only the beautiful part. You wouldn't believe it. It's just over the hill. It's amazing. It's just... It's beautiful. It's just full of om and spirituality and noticeably less dogs on the dance floor. And, um, and if you're lucky in the beautiful part, you'll bump into some of those perverts who've had to relocate their businesses from the hinterland areas of Australia <laughs> over to a country where collecting vulnerable women is slightly less frowned upon. So, yeah, slippery old slope yoga, isn't it? But that's it. With yoga, right, one minute you're in a beautiful Byron Bay studio just down-dogging and <laughs> you look over your shoulder and the yoga instructor's back there tucking his stiffy into the sash of his caftan. <laughs> and you go, that's fine, that's probably just an isolated incident. <laughs> and the next minute you're in a, you're an exclusive holistic femaleness retreat in Bali in a remote location, just getting invited to the guru's special gazebo of oneness. <laughs> to sweep it out and administer his daily perineum massage. And 
And that's, that's the nice part of Bali. <laughs> I'd rather be down in Kuta getting a half stub of your bin tank smashed across the back of my fucking head any day. It's, a, it's one of those places too where men come back, right? This guy I work with, he came back from his latest trip to Bali. And he said, look, I've been to Bali again. I brought back a little souvenir. Go off. Man, that sounds sus, man. So, <laughs> souvenirs are fine, but when you say little souvenir, we're, we're not talking about a snow dome or a fridge magnet, are we? No. You've gone and got yourself another cluster of boils around the base of your tockley, haven't you, filthy animal? He said, no, 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 nothing like that. And how dare you, one of my oldest and closest friends judge me based only on the cliche that I've been to Southeast Asia by myself again. Uh, <laughs> particularly galling in front of my new fiance here, whose anglicised name is Little Souvenir. <laughs> so, um, so this this thing, right? That's that's fine in those situations, but the ridgy dish, that's got no business at school pickup. I saw Cool Dad, right? <laughs> this, this fucking hacky sack owner at a. He was at a kid's party in a public park. It was one of those parties where they'd set up a slack line, which is a ratchet strap that the moderns put between two trees to act as a handy trip hazard for people like me. And the kids can try to balance on it. It's a good time, whatever. But cool dad, because he's cool dad, he had to go himself. And right in front of everyone, he's attempted a backflip dismount and ended up with one leg either side of the thing. Which most men on their better late than never path to maturity would see doing your nuts on a truck strap as <laughs> a watershed moment. <laughs> but not this poon, no way. This <laughs> one of these guys who says things like, oh, age is just a number. <laughs> well, yeah, well, so is bone density, you fuck stick. <laughs> so, last time I saw this negligent parent, he was down at a trampoline centre. I don't know if any of you have one near your houses, but there's a trampoline centre near where I live. And it's a trampoline centres, it's a place you can take your kids and they can just rattle their brains about for five or six hours in a row under what must be said is very lax supervision. <laughs> and then you just take them home, put them to bed, hope they wake up. <laughs> but I was down there, right, and I saw Cool Dad then, because he's Cool Dad, he got himself a wristband and had a go himself while his kids were on there. It was just heaps of kids and cool dad double bouncing him, having a bloody great time. And after only 10 minutes of frolicking, I heard that scream, that horrible scream you only ever hear from children when they're thinking, shit, we should have got ourselves a more appropriate hero in our lives. Um, one more in touch with his aging physical limitations, such as our new stepfather, Daryl. Um, because cool dad, he was being wheeled onto an ambulance with a compressed spine and a broken nose inflicted by his own knee. <laughs> and he's in quite a lot of pain. He had his hands on his head there and he had to take one of them off to show us that he's all right. <laughs> Causing everyone else to see what was going on up there. <laughs> and then they knew what I already knew. The cool dads are no good fucking losers. Just <laughs> trying to hide their baldness one way or another. <laughs> and I, I'm not here to take pot shots at baldness, but I just, you know, see the, the light shining off a few domes here, it's fine. <laughs> it's, male pattern baldness and, and, and vanity have had a long-standing toxic relationship throughout the ages. If you're gonna go bald, who cares? Just do it with some dignity and let it happen. You don't need people around you who are gonna mock you for what you look like, it's ridiculous. You need to be surrounded by people who love you for who you are. A revolting little fucking spam head. <laughs> So, so a lot of marriages now, they don't, they don't last at all. Now, it's not just because men just keep continuing to decide to go bald. No, it's, some, some marriages are doomed from the start. I, I know a bloke, right, and he's one of these guys, he considers himself such a catch that he thinks he's been railroaded into marriage. He says things like, oh, I thought I'd better do the right thing, put a ring on it, make an honest woman out of her, that sort of shit. Just setting the rest of his life up on a solid bedrock of resentment. <laughs> some woman stealing from him his prime golfing years. <laughs> and after enough of this sort of chat, even I had to say, look, mate, surely as a man, even a cowardly husk of a man like you, you're going to have to shoulder some of the responsibility for your predicament here. 
Why would you propose to such a horrible sounding battle axe who never wants you to have fun for the rest of your life? She sounds awful. What have you done? But then I met her and she was actually very, very nice, making him the malingering liability in the relationship. <laughs> and there's always one. And, but it didn't stop him from using some classic old school wife euphemisms to describe her behind her back, such as slave driver, boss, fun impediment, excess baggage, expense account, albatross, this sort of thing. And I've got to say, I got into this myself and it is quite fun. <laughs> And before anybody panics, I'm not one of those Neanderthals who's still in charge of stuff around his house. Don't worry about it. We, we, were, having a, we were having a dinner party at my place, right? And at one stage of the night, I sat down on the recliner and cracked a can. And my wife said, what are you doing? And I said, whatever I want. <laughs> and everyone there laughed so hard. <laughs> the, the children were laughing. There was an elderly neighbour there. She put her back out laughing. <laughs> and how ridiculous it is, the concept that I might be in charge of when I get to sit down. <laughs> I was at home one night, Rod, on a fairly rare night off. I was at home in bed, asleep, fast asleep. Exhausted, I assume, from the two jobs I have just to keep food on the table. <laughs> and I got woken up with, you left the light above the stove on. I said, oh, did I? OK, I'll get up and turn it off. She said, no, I've already turned it off for you. So okay, thanks very much. Um, now that I'm awake though, I reckon I'll just get up anyway and stand in the corner for the rest of the night. <laughs> just in case something else pops up. Yeah. So I'm not part of the problem, all right? It's fine. But some men though, they don't just harmlessly trash talk their wives behind their backs at lunchtime like the rest of us do for fun. <laughs> Some of them actively blame their wives for shit that they have clearly done, and that is beyond the pale. This, this is what happened to me, right? Someone parked halfway across our driveway. I couldn't get the Hummer in. I was like, fuck this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find who that was, I'm gonna bash them. I don't care who's driving that car. I don't care if there's a dog driving that car. I'm not above bashing a dog in extreme circumstances like this. So I wrote a note on a piece of paper. It said, look, I'm gonna find you, I'm gonna bash you. And, when I finish doing that, I'm going to sit on your chest and punch you with your own fists <laughs> while telling you to stop hitting yourself. <laughs> I'm going to give you a few crepex, some Chinese burns. I'm going to twist the nipples until you tell me I'm the greatest. <laughs> I'm going to ram your dax right up your clacker. <laughs> and then I'm going to cupcake you with a revolting silent fart. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. And then I folded it up, put it under the windscreen wiper neatly and went back inside and got on with my business, as is my protocol. <laughs> but then... Later on in the afternoon, right, I was outside on the footpath barbecuing some stuff. And <laughs> this guy has approached me from up the street, came straight up to me, said, look, man, I, I just want to come up and apologise. I'm so sorry. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that was our car parked across the driveway this morning. I've just left the dragon's lair for a minute to tell you this. So I've asked the Queen Bee not to park across driveways, but does the old hen listen? No. I said, oh, right, yeah, Erin Dawes was it, the old bat. The bloody commander in chief, the, the ball and chain, the, the trouble and strife, was it? The old bag. Yeah, mate, don't worry about it. I've been married 15 years myself. You get less for murder. Yeah. Oh. Man, I'm, I'm fresh out of the war department myself. I'm just out here recooking the sausages. They weren't done enough for the Queen of Sheba. And uh, I don't think I need to tell you how many times I've had to ask that barracuda not to leave aggressive messages on people's windscreens. <laughs> so, some, some men though, they don't just blame their wives for stuff that they've done, they'll blame anything for their shit behaviour. And this is something I've gotten into, it's pretty good. You know, it's a, I'm someone who quite likes living well beyond his means. And for my entire adult life, everyone around me has just been telling me I'm a dickhead who can't budget. But turns out I went and got myself diagnosed with something. So, <laughs> like everything else in my life, it's quite clearly not my fault. I knew I was a victim of some description. And while I'm here too, I'm not, I'm not gonna sink it into to mental illness. It's bloody, you know, that's crazy. What no one's reiterating for me with mental illness though, is how, how great it is for, for people like professional athletes and myself to just rebrand our irresponsible shit behavior. <laughs> on something that is largely and conveniently intangible. 
excluding, of course, your more visible mental illnesses, such as bodybuilding. <laughs> But, I, you know, the actual mental illness, though, it is a serious issue. It's not, it's not something to poke fun at. Mental illness is serious now. It's as serious now as it is popular. <laughs> and while I'm not a practitioner, I've never really had the spare time, I have dabbled. <laughs> and I, of course, sought treatment to find out exactly why the world hasn't provided me with everything I deserve. <laughs> and along the way, I found out that I have never actually done anything wrong. Although, pre-self-diagnosis, some of the things the black dog did on my behalf, Jesus Christ. If, if my condition allowed me to feel some form of shame or embarrassment, I'd be ashamed and embarrassed at what the black dog had done on my behalf. One time, the black dog didn't turn up to work for two months straight. I lost my job for that. There was no support network set up there for people like me who don't really like working. One time, right, the black dog sent some lewd photographs to the sister of a colleague of mine. She didn't want them, evidently. I got sacked for that. Even after I explained that those photos came from a very dark place. My crotch. One time, right, I went down to the pub to blow the froth off an icy cold jar of suds on a hot night after a hard day's yakka. And while I was down there, the black dog has drunk two jugs of beer in quick succession, become quite belligerent. And he went up for his third jug at the bar, and the bartender said, Sir, which is historically the worst possible start to a sentence when addressing the black dog when he's had a skin full. He says, Sir, why don't you make your third jug a mid-strength? To which the black dog replied, why don't you get fucked? Do I look like a heavily pregnant woman to you? <laughs> and then they booted me out on the street for that. At which point the black dog has busted three of my knuckles on a passing teenager's face. <laughs> I didn't know the kid. The black dog must have had some history with him. <laughs> and then society has decided to side with the 17-year-old boy with a broken jaw. <laughs> leaving me to think, fucking hell, what about the real victim here? <laughs> me. One of the biggest triggers, though, for people like me and my fairly unique condition of living beyond my means with no sense of recourse <laughs> is, of course, a humble upsell in a shop. I can't resist this. It's predatory behaviour that this still exists, and I've campaigned against it, but it's still there. But it's to a point now where I don't go into shops if I can avoid it, but sometimes it's inevitable. I, I went down to the petrol station to get some petrol, right, obviously. And... <laughs> I filled up the car and I looked across and some gutless wonder had done a jet snot on that keypad at the pay of the Bowser machine. It's like, oh shit, I can't touch that, that's disgusting. I'm gonna have to go inside and speak to another human like a rusty old dinosaur and pay for my fuel inside the shop, yuck. But I went in there right into the shop and I walked up the counter. The first thing I saw was this big bucket of hockey straps right next to the counter, really good quality, five bucks a pop. So, Yes, please. Didn't know I wanted one, but I'm going to have one of them. I'll have the yellow one with a black and blue fleck through it. Thank you very much. And for anyone in here who doesn't know what an Oki strap is, maybe a foreigner has snuck in without my knowledge. <laughs> an Oki strap, it's a length of elastic with a metal hook at each end that dads used to use on Boxing Day to strap shit to the roofs of their cars while yelling at the kids. Sometimes, pre-nanny state, shopping trolley collectors would use one to remove an eyeball. <laughs> Oh. Back when men were men, I wouldn't have had to explain that. But we're here now, aren't we? But anyway, there it was, big bucket of hockey straps, five bucks. I said, yes, please, I'll have one of them. And the slinky little opportunist behind the counter, he seen me coming, the predator. He said, look, you could get one for five dollars, or you could get three for ten. You should get three for ten, man, it just makes sense. You never know when you need an extra hockey strap, you should get three for ten. But I held strong. I said, look, rack off, you fucking crumb. I'm I'm not in the market for three hockey straps. I only want one. And how dare you tell me what does and doesn't make sense. You got some neck. I'm just, I'm just gonna have the one hockey strap, thanks, and the petrol, thanks very much. God bless and have a nice day. And then just got on with my business. So then this is what happened to me afterwards, Rod. I, I, I used to work with this guy, I knew him, and he was a, he was a genius. 
And the bar has been lowered on Genius, don't worry. <laughs> There was a time when to be a genius, you'd have to do something quite noteworthy with your brain. Not anymore. Now you can just set up a power tool to do something it wasn't designed for. And all your dickhead mates will look at you at lunchtime, sit down and, and lop the top off your tin of tuna with an angle grinder and call you a fucking genius. <laughs> it's insane. This is when I knew things had changed right. Some workmates and I go down to the beach in the morning before work for a dip. And in the winter months, it gets a bit frisky, making it more of a challenge to go to the toilet in the ocean. So... <laughs> I started before going in. I'd just sit on the beach and just pee in my shorts <laughs> and then go in. And for deliberately wetting myself, my boss called me a genius. <laughs> That's when I knew the goalpost had shifted somewhat <laughs> in terms of what constitutes a genius. But this particular genius, right, he's one of those extra fridge in the garage alcoholics. Like a <laughs> proper worm to the tomb polluter. And he'd. He'd set up a fourth television in his house so he could watch the cricket while he's on the toot <laughs> and never miss a ball. And, and all his mates, they catalogue that fourth television thing as an act of genius. That's insane. And this, this pube on the soap's name was... <laughs> his, his name was Wayney. So it's like already Wayne, which is a ticking time bomb to death by misadventure. <laughs> his parents had looked down on him as a baby in the hospital and thought, how do we knock 30-plus years' life expectancy? <laughs> off our beautiful, healthy baby boy, Wayne. I know. Give me a pen and the birth certificate. I'll sort it out right now. Put an extra Y in the end. And like a lot of premature death candidates, an extra Y somewhere in the name will do the job. And then the clock was ticking on Wayne's life. And it gets said a lot about tortured artistic geniuses that they often die in their 20s, but then so too do alcoholic car enthusiasts. <laughs> And Wayne was no different. When, when he was a tender 29 years old, Jesus wanted Wayne for a sunbeam. <laughs> Wayne went off to be with the Lord very soon after his de facto had taken off with the dog and the car in one hit, causing all his friends to say that Wayne died of a broken heart. Although the coroner did suggest that a drunken high speed quad bike ride on a dirt road at midnight with no lights or helmet were contributing factors. But we'll stick with broken heart. And when, and when someone dies now, it's very important to get it out there how much you care, how much your large heart has been affected by someone else's demise. It's always been the first step in the grieving process to say how much you care about someone who's dead. And, but hasn't the internet gotten us out of a pickle here? Like pre-internet, families, you actually, you, they used to have to grieve in private. Yuck. Now... <laughs> You can tell millions of people how much you care about someone who's dead. You can, you can start up a crowdfunding tribute page about it. You might not even know them that well. You can just stick up some crying face symbols and shit on there to say how much this has affected you and that you're a nice person. It's amazing. You can write stuff on there. You can say, look, uh, you know, I didn't know you that well, but um, I'll always cherish the time that we shared in Nang and <laughs> you let me have a lick of your triple ripple ice cream. Um, Words can't describe how much I'm going to miss you, baby girl. But here are some words anyway. <laughs> I really hope that unlike some surface paradise apartment blocks, the balconies in heaven don't have rickety handrails. <laughs> it's, it's a fair way down. I... I was going to skate over to your favourite frozen yoga shop this afternoon and have a double tutti fruity in your honour. But well, I think in lieu of that and the situation here, I'm going to donate that $10 to your parents. I've created a fund for them, don't mention it. Um, <laughs> but also, don't get ahead of yourself. There is a small chance that despite my benevolence, you may in fact remain dead. But I just <laughs> really sincerely hope that my generosity and my $10 go some way toward easing the pain of the loss of their child. Can't pay damn cunts. <laughs> So Wayne's mates, right, they were slightly more primitive than the internet age grieving process. They, they set, Wayne's mates, they set up a, a shrine for Wayne in his honour. To celebrate nearly three decades of Wayne, they've erected a shrine for him. But they, they put it there, like right there, right where it happened, in arguably one of the less happy locations of Wayne's life. <laughs> they've made a shrine for him of tangible stuff, some of which wasn't weatherproof, but there it was. And, and I go to shrines a little bit, right? Some of you might go to shrines. I don't know. How would I? 
Well, when I go, 100% of the ones I've been to, they consist of that perplexing, yet very common combo of limited edition Jack Daniels memorabilia <laughs> and teddy bears. And as an added bonus at Wayne's, it had three hubcaps really high in the tree. And when I got out there and saw that, I thought, man, some grief-stricken mourner has had the presence of mind to come out here with three of Wayne's favourite brand of hubcap and an extension ladder. That's incredible. But that wasn't the case at all. What had happened was a couple of Wayne's closer mates had come out and cracked a seal on the funeral bourbon and then they had a kickabout and their footy got wedged in the fork of a tree really high <laughs> and they had to use the hubcaps to frisbee it out. <laughs> Simplest explanation is quite often the most correct one. Well, when I heard the horrible news though that Wayne had been pronounced brown bread, <laughs> signalling the end of his long and sometimes painful battle with Larrikin's disease. <laughs> Naturally, I went straight to the shops to purchase a few gifts for Heaven's newest angel and head out to the shrine. And I was looking forward to going out to the shrine to bid farewell to a brave knight and a sweet prince, etc. I was also looking forward to going out there so I could walk up the hill a bit and use the side of my shoe to put a line in the dirt to pinpoint the exact spot where I thought Wayne should have eased off the throttle. And mine wasn't the only line there. But when I got out to the shrine, right, first thing I did think when I arrived at the shrine was Struth. That is a thick trunk. That looks quite unforgiving. Right on the corner there. There's no way I'm going to be able to attach this cabbage patch doll with this custom mini Nissan Holden race team jacket <laughs> to a tree of that girth with just one hockey strap. Should have bought three. So, um, right. So I apologise to anyone who came out here tonight thinking they were going to see a genius. Hasn't worked out, has it? There's <laughs> so many geniuses in comedy. Like, you think, if you're a genius, you'd use your large brain to help society somehow, but there they all are, congregated in the arts, just seeking validation from strangers. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you wanted to, maybe you thought you were going to come out and see one of those geniuses we keep bringing here with their floppy Cambridge haircuts, just telling you that your one and two dollar coins are the wrong way around in terms of size. <laughs> and you get to sit there and go, are they, you fucking insipid little dreg? <laughs> you genius, bravo. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it took me a really long time to get here to Australia, even on a plane. Just like, did it, you drip. You know, like, a, like a, bra a foreign but therefore charming and brave genius. You know? Or maybe you wanted to see one of those ones who's 29 and he's scared of growing up like all his friends have, like a, like a coward but still brave, coward, fucking genius. Or, or, or maybe you wanted to see one of those ones who's managed to overcome obesity at one stage of their lives, like a brave, shrinking genius. <laughs> But you didn't. You got me, a rare non-genius comedian, sucked in. <laughs> and I know no one really knows who I don't know what you're doing here, really. But sort of no one really knows who I am. But I, I do a lot of stand-up. I'm just well enough known now to get people contact me to tell me they know someone who looks like me. <laughs> and usually they just send me a photo of Stifler and it's over. <laughs> Sometimes, though, they'll drag some hapless loser along to the foyer of a theatre where I am and go, this is the guy, mate. This is the guy I emailed you about. I oh, mate, he doesn't even like laughing. I made him come anyway, because here he is. He looks exactly like you. Get a photo with him. He looks exactly like you. And I'll give them this. It's always a white man under 50. <laughs> but beyond that, the similarities are ambiguous to me. It, look, it always looks like one of those blokes who's getting his life back on track. Okay, as in, oh, hey, kids, you want to get your box of Lego out of the rumpus? Now's the time to do it because Uncle Jason with a Y in the middle is going to be staying in there for a few weeks <laughs> while he gets his life back on track. Or, it's, or it, looks, it looks like one of those blokes who changes train carriages while it's moving. <laughs> oh, no. I spend a bit of time on trains, right? I never sat there and heard the shh of the doors open. I thought, oh, hot diggity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up in a second. There'll be a cool dude walking through there. I can't wait, it's probably going to be Fido Ditto or the Fonz. Yeah. Nah, it's always some shifty little window licker <laughs> with his eyes at different latitudes and a fishing rod in his hand, about a half a bucket of chicken away from a health event. <laughs> so, 
point is, it's all you got doppelgangers being presented to you against their will. You've got no idea how short and fat and ugly you really are. <laughs> Not my favourite style of contact with the public, though. My favourite is probably being contacted to get told I've said something intolerant, as if it's not me who wrote all this shit. And, and now, don't get me wrong, I love tolerance. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not a tolerance activist. I bloody love tolerance. It's amazing. <laughs> There's a growing list of stuff there that us tolerance advocates simply won't fucking tolerate. <laughs> and at the same time, I'm, I'm an advocate for free speech. I love free speech. Freedom of speech is one of my passions, to a point. <laughs> that point is my ear canal. <laughs> if I hear something I disagree with, I've got to take action straight away. I'll, I'll scramble all the progressives I know and say, hey guys, get behind your computers, let's sort this out like men. <laughs> there's, a, there's a concreter out in the suburbs, just use the word pork as a verb. <laughs> We're not having that. Sure, he's one of those guys who's doing one of those jobs we all hate and don't want to do. We could leave him alone, but fuck that. Let's make sure he's unemployed by the end of the day. <laughs> Job done. You know, there are a few aspects of society, though, that us tolerance activists haven't managed to infiltrate, such as the fucking real world, where <laughs> dorks are still getting bashed and there's bullying going on. And I, I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm sounding bullish here. It's, I'm, I'm not here to advocate bullying, but it's a bit like vaccines bullying, isn't it? If you receive no grassroots bullying growing up, none at all, then by the time you reach adulthood now and leave home at the age of 32 or 33... <laughs> You might not be equipped to deal with a world that doesn't celebrate weakness. You might have a boss who's a big bad meanie and he refuses to hand over the talking stick at lunchtime because you're crying. <laughs> and that's no good. There, there is still bullying out there. I, when I'm not touring, I work on building sites and it is just eight straight hours of offline bullying. <laughs> like, all the live long day, man versus man, no paper trail, bullying. <laughs> And it's fine. You give some and you take some. It's just like life. But sometimes it is a bit much. I, I fell off a ladder at work, right? And I was down on the ground in quite a lot of pain. While I was down there, I heard someone yell out, Smoko Poofters. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm going to have to get myself to the hospital. No one's going to drive me to the hospital and risk missing out on Smoko. <laughs> so I wrap my arm up in a makeshift T-shirt sling. I drove myself there. Manual car, changing gears, cross myself like that. Quite dangerous. Got to the hospital, right? First corridor I walked down, there's a guy walking towards me, one of those green floppy tracksuit get ups. I said, Hi, doctor, got a bit of a problem here. He said, Actually, I'm not a doctor, but I think I can help you anyway. What seems to be the problem? I'm the nurse. And when I finished laughing, I said, Well, the problem is, nurse, that I'm fairly sure I've broken my arm here. Although, before I left work, my boss did diagnose me with a sore vagina. So, while I'm down here, you might just want to check both. <laughs> All right. Hey. So, um, thanks very much for coming out tonight and taking a punt on someone who's not a light media news personality. <laughs> it's um, nice of you to do. I've been doing a lot of stand-up, right? And people... I've been getting told to do stuff that would make me more popular, and I just don't. I just want to do stand. I don't give a shit. People go, you know what you should do, mate. You know what people love. You know what's funny. You should go on those panel shows. Can you wink both ways? Have you got a blazer? Can you bloody? <laughs> can you raise one eyebrow at a time? And that conspiratorial. We're all in this together, or are we? You know. <laughs> but, yeah. You should take this special gun and shoot some rolled-up t-shirts at some desperate scabs at the cricket. <laughs> That's what's funny, man. I'm like, oh, no, I'm all right. I don't want to... I'm just going to do stand-up thanks some more. But I'm going to make one concession on popularity and, and sort of provide the outro music for tonight's show. But I need some help with it, obviously. So could you please welcome back to the stage, Cam Knight. Anyway, I know comedy's not enough now. You've got to leave a message with people. I don't want you to walk out empty-handed, so I'll give you a message if you want. Just bloody respect your elders, everyone. You know, regardless of their achievements or otherwise, just respect your elders. They've got decades of experience in existing that you don't have. It doesn't matter what they've done, you just should respect them. I, um, whenever I find myself in a bit of a pickle in life, I always hark back to something my grandmother used to say. Do any of you boys want another fucking sandwich? <laughs> anyway, before we go, we're going to get out of here and say to you, before we go, we're just going to ruin the most popular song ever written. So thanks very much for coming down. See you next time. Cheers.